The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to this webinar, the final webinar of IMI's AdaptSmart project. For two years, AdaptSmart has been looking at ways maps or medicine adaptive pathways to patients can be put into practice. We're in beautiful Budapest today for the project closing event, and today we'll be discussing how maps can be put into practice in member states, particularly in the CEE countries uh, in Eastern Europe. I'm Dwayne Schultes. I'm the Managing Director of Vital Transformation, and today I'm joined by several people who've been working in the project, as well as several experts who will be discussing the aspects of maps from their perspective. Uh, we're joined by Chila Pajge, the Director of Medical and Scientific Affairs from the Hungarian Medicines Agency. Did I do that okay, Chilla? Chilla, was that all right? I'm the Director General. Was that a, <laughs> thank you very much. No problem. Matthew <laughs> Bodes. Matthew Bodes from the European Patient Forum, as well as uh, Eurotis. Good afternoon, Matthew. Good afternoon. Uh, Solange Rohu, <clears throat> the Senior Director of Global Regulatory Affairs at AstraZeneca and the AdaptSmart Deputy Project Leader. Hello, Solange. Hello, John. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And Andre Brookmans, who's the AdaptSmart coordinator, was supposed to be with us, but unfortunately, he's been detained somewhat. He's on the way, but we have a very good replacement for him. Uh, we're very uh, pleased to be greeted by Hans Georg Eichler, the, uh, the Senior Medical Director of the European Medicines Agency. Thank you, Hans Georg, for being here. Good afternoon. So um, quickly, before we move forward, <clears throat> If you're having trouble with the webinar, uh, you have the option to switch between computer and phone. So please use the tools at your disposal. We've also had dial-ins. We have 24 dial-ins for you to come in internationally if you're having difficulty with your computer connection. We will be opening up the webinar for Q&A in the last half hour. So please uh, feel free to interact with us, send in your questions as they arise, and we will certainly endeavor to answer them. And with that, I now hand over the floor to uh, Dr. hans Georg Eichler. Dr. Eichler, the floor is yours. Thank you. So one very quick recap after two years. Why did we get into this adaptive pathways idea? It emerged as the attempt to find a solution for what we call the access versus evidence conundrum. And I guess most people will be now familiar with what that is. Time is of the essence for some patients who have a disease now. But on the other hand, generation of evidence takes time. So how can we square the circle? And that is how the adaptive pathways idea was born. Very early on in our work at the consortium, we had agreed on the grand vision of what MAPS should do. And essentially it is to seek to foster access to beneficial treatments for the right patient groups at the earliest appropriate time in the product lifespan and in a sustainable fashion. So every word within that statement has been turned over many times. And that is still the focus of our consortium. That is still the, the mission of the Adaptive Pathways idea. It's about earliest possible access to beneficial treatments. And to foster that idea, uh, the Innovative Medicines Initiative has funded a major public-private partnership, the Adapt Smart Consortium, that ran from at mid-2015 until the end of last year. There were 22 FPM members on board, two patient organizations. There was the European Regulatory Network, and we had HTA groups, and payers were observers. So we have produced a number of documents, a number of reports, um, and both with regard that you will hear more about. And some key questions, and I will then stop, is only the engagement criteria for maps. Why do we want to do that? Under what circumstances? And again, all these words that were in our original um, mission statement come up. Do we find a beneficial treatment with a high likelihood of making a difference in a patient's life? Can we identify the right patient groups? Can we design a prospective, iterative um, evidence generation plan? Do we have tools to ensure appropriate util product utilization? And do we have, that it was very important from the beginning, uh, strategies for payers in case they are um, stranded, so to say, with an underperforming or poorly documented product? And there are a few other questions. So in a nutshell, these are the criteria when we have decided that this is where we should all bend over backwards and where we should engage for maps. And on top of that, we have designed a number of pathways 
um, the ways of interacting between the different stakeholders. Thank you very much. So this is the pathway slide that has been designed by the project. Can someone walk us through this slide a little bit and describe how this is different from the current pathway and the theoretical principle? We see Andre has just arrived as well. Hello, Andre. Um, who, who would like to take a crack at explaining this? Because this seems to be one of the main deliverables of the project. So what the slide, we cannot go into every deliverable, sure. every detail here. But if you look at the slide, you will see the classic stages from discovery, preclinical, preliminary evidence, review, and post-authorization um, that we all know. A key thing here is the size of these cogwheels represent the complexity of interaction and sometimes also the duration of the process, but certainly the complexity. And what that process seems to mirror, what wishes to mirror here is at what adaptive pathways moments should the various decision makers and stakeholders inter interact and in what way. And it really starts at the time of preclinical development. Discovery is probably a bit early, but at the time of preclinical development, the first interactions with downstream decision makers should already occur in the sense that there should already be a preliminary agreement. Is this of MAPS quality, this product, this molecule? Will it likely deliver? And so as we go through the knowledge and evidence generation of that product, preclinical, then clinical, and then into the review phase, there will be an increasing amount of interactions that is meant by these smaller circles. And then we go through the various milestones like authorization, pricing, the HDA considerations, pricing, and then utilization. And the key bit here, and that is my last statement, is that that post-authorization is such a big cogwheel. And that is probably has been underappreciated in the past that both knowledge generation and the utilization of a product in the post-licensing phase are of key importance. You say that this pathway would be used for products that are MAPS capable. How are we defining that? Is that unmet medical need primarily? How are we, who wants to chime in? Matthew, from the patient's perspective, you, you're often very articulate on this issue. What, what do you feel when we say MAPS capable? I think the main issue here, and that's what uh, Ansgog just said, is about the need for patient to have access to medicine, but not all the patient at this stage. That would be too early in this protocol space, but really the high and med medical need. Now, how do we define the high and med medical need? I think that's a key issue, and there have been a lot of discussions, not a single answer so far. So no one agreed on a single definition of a high and med medical need. Nevertheless, if we take this quite fair understanding of a high and met medical need, that would be during the iterative process where the decision will be made. And from the perspective of all the stakeholders on the table, then we can decide if a product can go or not go on the additive pathways. Okay. I think that's the understanding in the, in the, in, in the consortium. Solange, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, and you, you, you uh, probably remember, you know, the slide that was presented by Hans Georg with regard to the uh, criteria. So this, these are very important ones. So meaning, you know, the opportunity to, to through this criteria to guide, you know, the selection of the maps product because not all product you know will be uh, uh, let's say uh, maps capable so this is something to remember and of course uh, unmet need this is of course something of course of interest so meaning that you know uh, we we should be able to identify you know uh, at an early stage uh, a transformative drug that could you know fit uh, uh, a high unmet need and of course uh, as soon as you know the process is progressing it will be quite important that you know all the people engaged really committed you know to uh, uh, to the progress you know of uh, this drug development you know will be able you know to uh, look at you know all the evidence uh, data generation and understand you know whether or not this product is still maps capable Okay, Matthew, you want to and I just want to, to add on, on, on something. The engagement criteria were never designed to be a yes or no, neither a decision tree. It's to guide the discussions within those iterative uh, meetings. Great. Now, Chilla, you have the dubious honor of having to implement this yeah. <laughs> in a country. So we'd really like to get your perspective on how you see this operating within the Hungarian health system. So thank you again 
for joining us. It's really lovely to meet you and have you here. So uh, the floor is yours, please. So uh, thank you for the sure. invitation and thank you for coming to Hungary because uh, HTA is uh, an important aspect of our work at the agency because we are in the position that we have an HTA department. So we have a view, and but it's a different, uh, it's a little bit different of the view of the others, of course, because we are regulators, so we have to take care of a lot of things. So if you just, uh, yeah, okay. So, and uh, what are what are uh, the aspects of the regulators? So, we have to, of course, uh, provision the best available uh, medicines to the patient patients in the shortest period of time and of course on an affordable price but we have to ensure patient safety as well at the same time and previously we used to have full dossiers and now we have full dossiers as well if we don't uh, choose this way or agree this way and we have appropriate uh, pharmacovigilance information uh, and an early filing, early assessment, close follow-up, big data use, registries, continuous reassessment of risk-benefit ratio. So I think that is very important uh, through the whole process. And how, how is Hungary doing or as far as big data capability? Do you have the registries in place where you're starting to use that? Unfortunately, we have very few registries at the moment, but now uh, uh, in the healthcare, we started to use uh, eHealth features. So from now on, it looks that we can use big data uh, very well, and it's very special for clinical trials. So we think that that will be a place for for using big data in the future. Excellent. So, and uh, uh, I think the adaptive pathway, this is an opportunity as it was discussed before, because we can have, with a different approach, we can have an earlier access to the, to the drugs, but uh, uh, it is, of course, not for all medicines, because we have to assess it carefully, uh, which uh, drug is uh, a candidate or can be a candidate for adaptive pathways. And of course, we have to uh, take care and collect real world data uh, during the course of, of the procedure. And uh, that is the issue that at the moment uh, we don't have enough registries in the country, but we will try to improve that part as well. And, and we are in close, col uh, close collaboration with, uh, with uh, uh, the insurance uh, company and also with some of uh, some of the companies uh, because they provide important information and data and i think especially we discussed earlier something about uh, hepatitis c uh, questions which is an interesting and revolutionary uh, achievement i i think and in this part, Hungary was able to use very well uh, this data. And I think we uh, are in the situation that we can reduce the number of hep C patients dramatically. So. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, Okay, so that is uh, the concept of adaptive pathway concept and how to involve the stakeholders into this concept. And as I mentioned it before, we have the HDA body within our organization. So I think it's a very good situation because when we start the collaboration with the companies, we can involve HTA in a very early phase. And uh, of course, we uh, try to and we have to maintain the highest standards of benefit risk assessment and ratio. Do you see that the HTAs are willing to experiment? Do you see the insurers and the HTAs willing to try new pathways now? Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your candor. <laughs> I think in uh, at this part of the world, uh, the insurance uh, companies, agencies are a little bit more conservative. Sure. So it, of course, depends on the budget that they have. 
but I think if you use HT well, uh, then then you can introduce uh, new drugs much earlier. So that is that is the message what I try to to send to my <laughs> colleagues sure. and make them a little bit more brave. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, it's not just Hungary. I'm sure we can all no, attest. No, no, no. That is the region. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we we have less opportunities, less money, and maybe less practice. But I think Hungary started to to build up HTA um, more than 13 years ago. So we followed uh, the UK. Uh, very fast, and we collected information. We are participating in in different working groups, and so on and so on. So we collect information and share information and gather knowledge. So I think it's it's a part that improves very fast, and we are accepted more and more. Excellent. Sorry, we can. Okay. Uh, we know we all know that EMA is uh, committed uh, to enabling <laughs> early patient access, and as it was discussed with unmet medical need and major public health interest, but it's really hard to define what are these categories, and. Um, the patient associations they have a big role in it to bring attention to draw the attention to the high unmet medical needs because sometimes we are speaking about really orphan uh, statuses or orphan um, drugs and and uh, rare diseases so we need them as well sometimes it's not very pleasant <laughs> but it's very important Matthew, yeah. from, from your perspective, how do you see the various patients groups working between Western Europe and more Central Eastern Europe? Uh, do you see the, the similar line of activity and a similar alignment and philosophy? Yes, because access, the need to access is the same if you're a UK patient, if you're a patient in Sweden, in Spain, or in Hungary. If you need a drug, you need a drug. You have the same symptoms for the same disease. So the, the need to access to promising drug so we need access early to drug that will bring a benefit. Not any drug on the, not any drug, not really early. That's not the point. But a drug which is promising is accepted, is, uh, I think, by the patient community. Shall we, uh, next slide? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay, that is about Prime, but we all know about uh, Prime, so I don't want to take the time regarding this. But I really think that what is not really discussed deeply is uh, is uh, the benefit risk ratio so we have to consider it that that we have to follow up this part very cautiously mm -hmm. because uh, it depends of course on on the nature of the disease so what is uh, what is uh, the acceptable risk it it very much differs uh, uh, from disease to disease, but but we have to safeguard that part very much, and we have to collect pharmacovigilance information cautiously, but because we cannot risk uh, patient safety during the whole process. I think mm. it's important, and I think we all agree to that. Definitely. Yeah. Um, here we go. This is this is the how you see the pathway working in Hungary. Yes. Yeah, because uh, and and I think it's very very important because we collaborate uh, with EMA very closely. So we joined the innovation network. We we have our innovation office from last year, and it means that it is a new possibility for the Hungarian SMEs and even bigger companies to come with their uh, new ideas to approach us with their new products, future products, so with, with the continuous support, we really can um, have good results. We have uh, very good collaboration with the academia. We have agreements with all uh, the universities in Hungary. So uh, it, it looks that uh, step by step, we can build up really a good structure for bringing up the new information, the new ideas, and not only in drugs, but in, in other parts, because IT is a very interesting part, what is uh, developing very fast, and it's in connection with the drugs, with 
with uh, with uh, medical devices and so on and so on and and it's really i think a revolutionary period when agencies can decide to stay and and be restricted and and observe what's going on or they can be very active and supportive and they uh, can still safeguard the patients and 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 help uh, this kind of revolution dr eckler from your perspective are you seeing the relationship with ema develop more in Eastern Europe? How do you see it evolving compared to some of the traditional Western European agencies? Well, I guess, as we've just heard from our patient representative here, the needs from the patients are the same. The biology is the same. And as regulation concerns itself with biology and not with cost, I think on our regulatory side, we don't see a divide between Eastern Europe and Western Europe. We have the same concerns, and sometimes we may differ when we look at a particular situation, but there is no systematic divide. I think that would be wrong. Where you may have more of a systematic divide, that has to do with purchasing power, but that is, of course, when it comes to pricing and reimbursement, but that is a separate issue. So I would say from the EMA side, which is the regulatory side, I don't see a divide here. We have our quarrels, we have our debates, <laughs> that is normal, that's healthy, yes. and otherwise we wouldn't do our job well, but there is no East versus West, West or any other way around. Um, anything else? Chile? No, you're done. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. Andre, I'm going to bring you in now. now. You'll have to share a mic here. Andre has arrived. Thank you very much. You were a, form, you were a former regulator. How do you see your experience in the Netherlands compared to what Chile is dealing with now, trying to put these in place? Do you see, from your perspective, do you see differences, or do you think it's just like Dr. Eckler saying, we just need to discuss more and, and work through it? Well, when you look at it from, um, uh, let's say, a historic perspective, it took also many years, I think 1965, when we founded the uh, European system of uh, medicines regulations, and it took some time in order to get harmonized approaches. So in a way to to, to harmonize also more, let's say the, the, the downstream uh, uh, handling of, 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 of new products needs also time. And, and the good thing is that nowadays we have Unetta who is working very closely together in order to make things happen, which is very important. Joint assessments, uh, perhaps uh, Later on, perhaps a, a assessment for the whole of the uh, European Union. It all it all will contribute to, let's say, making a more efficient um, uh, system. But we, as uh, uh, within our current consortium in Adapt Smart, we're looking beyond that to see whether the the, the cogwheels can interact yeah. in, in a much more closer way, in such a way that we can streamline the whole whole process, the whole process. and align. Uh, perceptions, beliefs, and also uh, guidances in such a way that we can have a smooth uh, system which operates in in in, in favor of the, of the patients. And of course, we all, we are in the European Union. We are we are a big big continent. So there will be differences in regions and so on. But if there is a willingness to collaborate and to also to experiment with with new methods. Of, of, of data collections and data assessment, I think that will be always always be the advance of the patients. Now, speaking of the patients, Matthew, obviously you're here. We've had a few questions from you. Could you give us your perspective on how MAPS is working both from your artist, the orphan disease side, as well as in your new role with the European Patient Forum? How do you see all this fitting together? Thank you, thank you Dwayne. First, I'd like to take a step back and to talk about MAPS and Adapt Smart because the two different things. MAPS is a concept. And within it, this concept, there is a clear understanding, a common understanding that it's needed for specific disease and promising product if they fit the criteria. There is a fair agreement, which is not a common understanding. For me, it's a fair agreement that we need to do something. But who is we, right? And that's, that's really interesting. But it's everybody, all the, the community of medicine developers, and that, that is all the chain of the value chain of, of a medicine. And that's the beauty of MAPS, I believe. 
The problem is there will be a lot of stakeholders around the table doing these iterative discussions. And, and that is creating for us a major issue in who is going to own this whole program, who is going to organize that, who is going to have the ownership, the stewardship of, of maps. The EMA, probably not. The HTA, not really yet. The payers, no. The payer, the, the patient popular, the patient community, for sure not. Who is the player here that we want to talk? Nobody talks about. Would that be the European Commission? Could that be one of the ownership of maps in the future to organize that? Not everybody is agreeing around the table. You don't see it. It's like in the radio, but I can tell you that not everybody agrees. But. But well, why not? <laughs> Could it be a possibility? Because no one else seems to be to have the the power to do that. Okay. So so that's that's already a common uh, mm -hmm. a, a key question for us since the very beginning. And now Adap Smart, and I'm coming to Adap Smart. Adap Smart is is ending, and what's next? So to come back to Adap Smart, Adap Smart was a great adventure, and I choose the word adventure for for a reality, because. It was a mean to come to this common uh, understanding and this fair agreement. Uh, but that's fine. But we need to look at the world as it is and not as we wish to be. Okay? Because here on the table, we are believers. But outside of this table, uh, there is many people that don't really believe, don't want to talk uh, and to hear about uh, additive pathways and, and maps. Adapt Smart, one of the virtues of Adapt Smart, are the pinpoint clear barriers. Legal barriers at the national level, That's it takes a long time to overcome those. And it's not because you wish to change that. Legislation takes a long time to change. And that's something that will need to be addressed. Because if you, even if you have goodwill at the people level, if the system isn't ready, then it's not going to work. Talking about the system, adapt, uh, maps and additive pathway relies a lot on gathering the evidence. In Hungary, we had um, a statement earlier not really ready yet. Many countries, I would like to say all the countries are not really ready yet. How do we move from this is what we need to this is what we have? So it's not it's not in the mandate of, of, of Adapt Smart. It's a goodwill. It would need a lot of work and we're not ready yet. So we need to be cautious a bit. So overall, Adapt Smart was positive. Huh? First and mainly, it built trust among the different partners. I'm not going to cannibalize you, and I can trust you. And that's 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 key in the beginning, <laughs> from the very beginning. It's a low bar, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but but remember the first meetings, yeah. and I think cannibalizing is, is the right word here. There were knives and forks out. <laughs> <laughs> so so we moved, we passed that, and I think that was positive, right? So at least Adapt Smart brought that. So that so that was very good. Now I would like to talk about what's the role of patient organization in this whole system, right? We don't want to take the ownership of maps and to organize this and to put everybody on the table. And we should not be accountable for this if something goes wrong. Okay, that's something I want to put. We don't have a public mandate okay, to, to be taken uh, accountable for if something goes wrong in safety, security, etc. So that's something. However, it's not because we're not accountable that we cannot be partners, trusted partners. And that will also require from us to bring to the table something. What can it be? Trained, empowered, supported, mentored patient uh, representative to be at the table and to bring the value and to bring the voice of the many. Okay. So that's something which is on us. It takes a lot of resources to do that. It takes the capacity to do that. Your oldest is already organizing patient engagement in medicine development. Okay, supporting patient representative to attend meeting, uh, to attend the MOCA also um, in the, on, the, on the payers level. So there is a lot of initiatives doing ar around it, but it takes a lot of resources and we just need to be ready to do that. Otherwise, we will be facing a problem, bringing the voice of patient we are not ready to discuss or we don't have the follow-up, we don't have the empowerment to do that. So, so that was one. So the patient community is ready to do it if we have the capacity to do it. Otherwise, we will under-deliver, and that's not the right way to go. And then the last point, and just because we are here in, in, in Budapest, um, what about Central and Eastern Europe? Because that's actually the title of, the, of this webinar. Um, actually, I'm not the right person to, to, to answer this question, but I did a, a bit of, of research. If I take EPF and Eurolis, which are membership-based organizations, 
Within those two organizations, we have about 90 members uh, from CEE countries. You may think it's not a lot, but we have this cascade um, phenomenon where if I take the Hungarian Rare Disease Association, they have 50 members. So you can multiply this by the numbers of members. So we have the capacity to reach out to those people. But if I have smart in the future, I'm not going to in the near future, but in the long future, if it comes mainstream, or if we have to have a lot of patient engagement in medicine development, that will require that we bring to the table a lot of people. And a lot of people bring that to us, resources, human resource, time, skilled people. And that would be the elephant in the room, the second elephant in the room. How do we structure our patient community to bring empowered patients to the table? And that's a concrete here. Do you see that the empowerment right now is a huge barrier to making this happen, Matthew? Do you see that as one of the key constraints? So um, I don't see empowerment as a main barrier. Okay. <laughs> the, the, because, the ability to deliver the empowerment, I guess. Somehow, yes. Yeah. Some, sometimes we, we're facing the problem that we didn't find the right patient right. to attend the meeting. And that's super frustrating. Yeah. Super frustrating. Because there is a willingness from all partners. We advocate for that. And we need to deliver. Sometimes they just don't exist. If we take really rare um, disease, they just don't exist. So there is nothing we can do about it. But we need to have people who speak English. It's not always uh, yeah. easy to find. So, yes, sometimes it's frustrating. But it's, it's much better than before. And it's much less better, much as good than, than in the future, for sure. Well, in getting back to your point about who should lead AdaptSmart, uh, lead maps after AdaptSmart, we do have 100 people who registered for the webinar. If anyone would like to chime in on that in the comment page, please submit your questions and please tell us if you think it should be the European Commission. We'd be very interested in hearing what you would like to say. I get the feeling I'm probably not going to get anyone in this room to commit on the record as to what they'd like to do, unless Hans Gehrig has something he'd like to say. Or... Well, until people come in with their questions or views. Um, Mattia, you said who should be the owner of the process. Maybe there isn't an owner because that will be very difficult. Who could be it? But I would argue who should be the engine driving it forward? Who should be pushing it? And there I just see one candidate group, and that is the patients. Pushing, because advocating, yes. Sorry to cut here. Pushing, advocating, yes. Supporting, yes. Empowering the different national stakeholders, yes but organizing it, that's something different. Well, but what you just said is quite a big of a commitment, and that's <laughs> quite good enough, I would say, for a start. Okay, so before we uh, open the floor up for questions, or I ask a few more, I'd like to give industry their shot. Also, Solange has been the co-director of the project. Solange, I understand uh, you've got some slides here. Yes, so please, we'd like to have your input on this before we open up, so the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you, Duane. So I noticed, you know, just a comment, you know, before starting, you know, uh, uh, and going through the two slides, you know, I put together, I noticed that uh, when um, uh, Matthew, uh, uh, you know, mentioned the different people, you know, uh, stakeholders, you know, involved in the discussion, he didn't mention the industry. industry. Was missing. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, <laughs> and <laughs> I'm not saying that industry, you know, should be the owner, but at least uh, the starting point, because if we are not ready, you know, to... Uh, put an asset, you know, onto the table for, you know, discussion and, uh, you know, that, you know, to progress the discussion and to use the MAPS pathway, then, of course, uh, there will be nothing to happen. So this is this is what, you know, is still missing at this time point. And this is why tomorrow, you know, there will be the opportunity to go through, you know, a, a virtual case that I hope, you know, we hope, you know, uh, will give ideas, you know, to all industry players. So this is something that, you know, we can expect for the near future, hopefully. Okay. So would you want to touch on your slides? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> so as you said, we have been on a journey. And um, the journey has not ended, uh, that's for sure. And I remember that when we started, we started with uh, lots of excitement and lots of uncertainties as well, because of course, uh, we were you know, uh, uh, due to explore a highly sensitive and controversial uh, topic, which is of course, uh, uh, adaptive pathway, this uh, you know, concept of adaptive pathway. 
But uh, definitely, and as you know, it was the objective of this uh, IMI project, you know, that was the opportunity to bring together all the relevant stakeholders around the table. And of course, all the stakeholders involved in the ecosystem, uh, 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 health, healthcare ecosystem. And of course, uh, Hans Georg, you mentioned who they are. And uh, um, I think it was really a, a very, you know, important um, uh, opportunity to address, of course, all the key uh, operational and strategic challenges in order to, uh, let's say, foster uh, the access uh, of patients to beneficial treatment. Uh, beneficial treatment that could, of course, uh, uh, address a specific uh, higher net needs. So again, um, uh, it, it was to look at, you know, uh, what could be those products. And as I mentioned previously, not all products, you know, could fit, could be, you know, a maps uh, capable. So this is something quite important. And of course, what is also quite important is how, you know, we could generate, you know, this, uh, uh, the data uh, that will help, of course, uh, uh, moving forward, you know, a transformative product. So clearly we are looking at an evolution, not a revolution. Since, you know, we have been uh, said that, you know, all what is being done has to be done within the current regulatory framework. So whether or not there will be the need, you know, in the future for, you know, some uh, changes, you know, in, in the regulation, in policy. Of course, this is something still to be seen. And we know how, you know, this uh, change process, you know, could be uh, long lasting. Uh, but uh, more importantly, uh, you know, about the fact uh, um, and the need to generate, you know, the appropriate uh, data. There's a need as well, you know, to look at, you know, what this, you know, change in drug development paradigm, you know, will mean for people. And, and first, you know, that will mean, you know, a change in the mindset. And it will be for all the stakeholders involved, not only industry, but everybody involved. So you mentioned that, you know, there are people uncertain, there are people who are pro adapt smart, others are, you know, against and others are, you know, in between. So, of course, uh, we've tried, you know, to address all these uncertainties uh, along, you know, our journey. And uh, what can be said, you know, at the end of the day is, of course, uh, since, uh, of course, the, the, uh, the project will close, you know, at the end of this month, just after, you know, uh, this uh, uh, two-day meeting, uh, then, of course, we, 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 we can say that, of course, our wish list, which was, in a way, quite realistic, um, has been completed. So in a way, I think that all of us, you know, in the consortium, we can be, uh, uh, let's say, proud of what has been, uh, what has been accomplished. Um, but there's always, you know, a but and a however. So however. However. Yes. Yeah. So we are definitely mm -hmm. conscious of the fact that, you know, this uh, concept uh, is something truly transformative, but in a way disruptive. So as it was said previously, we can expect that, you know, moving forward, uh, the progress will be slow, but it will have to come in one way or the other. And uh, I think uh, there's a need, important need, you know, to keep the momentum and to assess, you know, how uh, uh, in the coming months, years, you know, the approach, a concept, you know, will be uh, meaningful for everybody, all the stakeholders, and of course, uh, 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 first, you know, the patient. So, um, as well, we need to communicate further in order to enhance uh, the acceptance uh, of the concept. So that means that, you know, not only, you know, uh, uh, having everybody on board, including, of course, the Eastern country in Europe, because this is a concept, you know, that has started, you know, spreading out beyond Europe as well. So we could, you know, mention Canada, certainly. And uh, it, it's quite important uh, to uh, really look at, you know, this uh, dissemination activities and, and also to uh, um, make sure that, you know, we can integrate, and, and this is, of course, something important specifically for industry, you know, to integrate all the uh, uh, good, you know, work which has been done so far within Adapt Smart 
whether it is with regard to uh, data generation or whether it is with regard to uh, patient involvement and also uh, uh, engagement with uh, HTA bodies and payers. So this is the reason why, you know, at the end of the day with this project, as I said previously, we can be proud of it, proud of, you know, what has been achieved. But at the same time, we need to look at the future and what should come next. So this project was a little bit different, you know, as opposed to uh, any other IMI projects. And uh, it was, uh, as you remember, a coordination and support action. And we should remember what, you know, we were expected, you know, to deliver as output recommendation. And this is why, you know, uh, based on the work done by the different work packages, we've been able to identify uh, future research proposals. And we do expect, you know, that they will be uh, uh, looked at uh, uh, and considered, you know, seriously so that, you know, we can uh, uh, move uh, forward, you know, and, and progress, you know, the MAPS concept and have it, you know, finally viable and meaningful. Thank you so much. I have a just a quick question. Obviously, you've been very involved through AstraZeneca. How are your colleagues and other companies around the project? Do you see a similar level of commitment that you've had with AstraZeneca? How, how, what's the feeling? Is it quite diverse or is the, are more of the industry people warming up to the project of MAPS now? Yeah, you should remember that um, uh, when everything started, you know, uh, there were uh, 22 companies, you know, around the table. Then moving forward, uh, there were, you know, two uh, uh, additional companies joining. So 24, you know, and, and the same with regard to uh, the public partners. So me meaning that, you know, the interest was quite high, but still, you know, with uh, lots of question mark. But moving forward, uh, there has been, you know, more and more, you know, uh, engagement. And I, I have seen this, you know, within my own company. Uh, where people have started, you know, changing uh, the way uh, they are discussing about the concept and looking at, you know, this as a, an opportunity, uh, uh, showing that, you know, the change in the mindset, of course, takes time. And we can expect that, you know, they're moving forward. There, there will be even more, you know, people willing to use the pass and, and of course, to finally identify an asset that will be worth, you know, uh, going through the pathway. That's great, Solange. Thank you. Um, we're going to take any questions that you may have. Please use the question bar. We will uh, read those out as they come in. Again, it's uh, just the question bar on your tool there, and you can submit any questions you have. I guess from, from my standpoint, I've got a few questions here. At the member state level, so if we look at putting maps in the member states, so Chile, what we're talking about, how successful have we been over the last 33 months in Adapt Smart at moving the consciousness into the member states? Have we crossed those barriers? Have we, I mean, how much have we accomplished? Have we hit the targets? Do we still have more to do? How far did we go? I guess, Andre, I'll start with you on that. Well, it's an important question, and uh, but difficult to answer. Yeah. What, what I've noticed in, in, in the past uh, two years, two and a half years, is that uh, all stakeholders start to understand what is meant by adaptive pathways. And that's already an important asset. Um, but with regard to implementation, that's a different different story. And, and as mentioned by all of us, it will take some more time. But the willingness to to to, to notice that that there are other ways to reach the target uh, is there and 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 it needs some it needs some examples as so, uh, uh, assets I, I remember when uh, I, I was just started as regulator the the first hiv therapy went through the system very quickly even even without important scientific advice or joint scientific advice or whatever but there was a notion that from a public health perspective there was a need to do something and and what I see now with the the, the, the products coming into the let's say into the uh, forefront, important new products which which will need another approach of of regulating and 
and and and reviewing it with regard to the healthcare system and also its use that we need more adaptive pathways and i think even if this concept is still not accepted uh, by by all stakeholders i think the pressure will come from the product which will arrive look at the gene therapy and the car t therapy etc i have a checkpoint yeah absolutely uh, so i think one way or the other, we will be confronted with with with, with questions, issues which need to be addressed in a different way than we are handling the drugs nowadays. So I think there is a recognition of what MAPS means, but the implementation will take some more time. But I think with the products coming, I think we we will be forced to look at it in a different way at our system. Chilla, from, from your standpoint, how have these discussions evolved over the last three years when you first heard about adaptive pathways and how they're having these conversations now? Has there been a movement internally? Do you see more acceptance within yourself and your colleagues or how is this, how is this evolving? It's an interesting question because uh, uh, most of my colleagues, they they have been working for the Institute for ages, I mean for 20 or 30 years. So their, their approach is completely different or used to be different at the beginning because uh, it was the regulator's point of view that they have to have complete data sets and they have to evaluate those. So it was really hard to to make them understand that they have to move out from the from the silo and they have to approach this concept differently. But uh, fortunately, in the management, I have very uh, good people who have experience with with. Uh, um, HDA and with other parts, and they are very positive. So, with the combination of knowledge and with the combination the support. Of, of support, so we can overcome uh, this. And, and I think Hungary can be really a good example uh, how we handle uh, adaptive pathways especially in the future, because we are at the beginning of, uh, of the whole process. So um, we're, we're running out of time, unfortunately. Um, I'm sure we could talk for several more hours. There's one more question here that I'd, I'd like to propose to everyone. If you had one opportunity right now today to change something to promote an adaptive pathway process in Europe, what one thing would you like to see happen tomorrow? Andre, I'll start with you. That's easy. Uh, I could have. <laughs> um, I think the, the best way to to make things happen is to get the payers at the table at the early stage. Chilla, from your perspective? I would have been the same. Same thing? Uh, same thing, yes. Matthew. Let's try. Do it. Let's try. Do Let's it. Just try to do it. Yeah. And if it doesn't work, then, then we stop. We can always back on. And we have... We have pathways on the on the way that exist already so we it's not if we engage in maps it's not forced then we can always come back if we see that it doesn't work so with good awareness especially from the patient community that we can stop it in case this doesn't work it's too risky we cannot gather evidence as we hoped then we just stop if, if needed it's it needs to be bold so long yeah, uh, I mean, of course, I fully support, you know, what has been said so far. Um, I would say, uh, let's do it, definitely. Uh, let's, you know, adapt, change the mindset. And, of course, be uh, be brave and uh, also uh, look at, you know, what could be done uh, with regard to generating, you know, the data as appropriately as possible. Uh, since you know we are not expecting uh, the standards to be to be changed uh, but clearly you know uh, we need to use at the best you know the tools and the methods that we uh, have already whether it is also you know uh, procedures in place i mean you mentioned prime uh, but there are others as well. Conditional approval, you know, is one of those. So let's use, you know, all the tools and the methods we, we do have at our disposal and be more creative uh, in order to address, you know, uh, 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 let's say a new paradigm. So this is something quite important. 
Dr. Eckler? Well, Dwayne, you started your question the wrong end of the table, so these two colleagues <laughs> stole my response. Sorry about that. Yes, yeah. of course. My first uh, wish would have to be full engagement by payers, and that is obvious because the sustainability discussion, the cost issue is now so center stage that we have to have those in. But since they had my answer, um, <laughs> my second best answer is, and you may be surprised, Solange, is more um, courage from the industry side. I'm not surprised. I say, <laughs> I say, I say, be brave. So we we need to be yes. brave in a way. You know, we have the tools, we do have the methods. So let's let's do it. Um, one final question for you, Dr. Eichler. What is the status of the products that are currently in the EMA Adaptive Pathways pilot? What's going on there? So we have a number of products that are in a maps-like development situation. None of the products is yet on the market. And that is unsurprising because the whole discussion hasn't been going on for so long. Thank you very much. With that, I'd like to thank all of you for joining. Uh, it's been interesting. We had a little construction come in at the minute. We apologize for that. <laughs> Not much we can do about that. No. Uh, we're in a facility in Budapest and we're at the Reliant of the Worker Gods, I guess. Anyway, thank you very much for your, um, your listening and your patience and your questions. And uh, we conclude this <laughs> webinar, unfortunately. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Working at the depth of politics. <laughs> 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 <laughs>